said. <laughs> so we had a discussion already before, so it doesn't matter. We have at the moment one hour time for two presentations. My proposal would be to have 20 minutes and then a long discussion about it, because both topics are very interesting. And we are starting with the first one, which is in the medical field. And this is radio physician. And who has no physician? And what to rate him? Findings from a Lithuanian physician rating website. And presentation is part done by Joska Kersting. And he has also the second author, Frederick Boimer. The other both authors are not here. It's a pity, but OK. So let's see what we can do and how we can uh, discuss your presentation. Please start. Thanks. But what I have to say is this is a more or less German session at the moment. So the <laughs> I'm from Germany, the authors are from Germany, from the first and second paper. So this is a nice idea to have really some contact here and to see how the contact from Germany to Lithuania and to Lithuanian colleagues are running. Please Thanks. Ahead. Thanks for having me here. Um, I'm going to talk about the Lithuanian physician rating website. It's called pincetas.lt. And as you can read, we've got uh, one Lithu Lithuanian um, author in our team. He helped us translating the Lithuanian uh, language ratings. So, uh, rate of physician, it's a global phenomenon. Like, every country has its own portal website or several websites for rating one's own physician. And um, so far, the reviews have been extensively researched, oftentimes by um, doctors themselves, uh, part was by um, computer scientists uh, and computational linguists. The ratings usually are very positive or negative, uh, but oftentimes very positive, like in all rating websites. And um, the thing is, they affect the sensitive physician and patient relationship because, um, yeah, of course, usually you want to trust your physician and you want to be treated well. But um, with ratings, um, like, yeah, they are semi, semi anonymous afterwards, um, given for one physician, um, put this relationship in danger. And oftentimes, people reveal, reveal too much about themselves and they can be recognized by the physician, for example, or by neighbors or friends. So why is this important? Um, the websites affect significantly the success of a physician. So this is in the end effect about money and reputation. And oftentimes patients use them to base their decision on them. So they choose a physician based on reviews. And as I said, the privacy is in danger, even for the physicians. There are a lot of lawsuits in Germany done because of, yeah, physician uh, reviews. Uh, some physicians failed treated unfairly or um, yeah, they don't want to be rated at all. So it's a big issue in Germany at least. The um, thing is the websites do not check the identity of people. So they don't um, ask for the passport or something. Um, they do not check was this person really at this position at some time. And uh, in the German case, there are two websites, Yameda and Dog Insider. Uh, on Dog Insider, we had the thing of a problem. Um, the source code wasn't really well written, and we found a little hack. So it was possible to change one parameter, and then we could um, answer to a review in the name of a physician. This is, of course, legally highly problematic. I will later on show a little video for this. Just um, to give an overview, we have so far researched several uh, rating websites across Europe and the USA. As I said, in Germany, we are Yameda and Dock Insider. Now we are dealing with Lithuania's Pinsetas. Furthermore, we have researched websites from Austria, Switzerland, Spain and the USA. So why do we do this? It helps us to find good and bad um, characteristics of this website and um, we want to have or uh, develop a quality understanding. So what makes a good website, what helps people um, preserve their privacy, what helps a f physician to receive useful feedback and fair feedback. So 
What you do is we analyze the data set with natural language processing techniques. We want to find out which data quality we have and our fake data, for example. Furthermore, we want to um, have a brief look on waiting websites or health related websites in Lithuania at all because we want to underline the aspect that um, physician review websites are very unique when it comes to the user interaction. Most websites don't have this um, interaction component. So this is uh, the little video I will show just briefly on Germany's stockinsider.de um, how to do this little trick with answering in the name of a physician to a review. At first we uh, briefly show how many physicians are there on the portal. I think it's not really well readable but it's about 60,000. And you can even crawl the website by using a star in the query, so over 320,000 physicians. So if you then open a physician's website, looks like this, accumulated overall ratings and single reviews. Then the trick starts with opening the um, source code of a website. You can do this with any web browser like Firefox. You can read it now, but <laughs> the source code uses variables like Peter Pan, Peter Pan, Peter Pan. So it's not very professional. The dog is mad, bro, is another variable. So I think this is the one for answering. If you delete one word, you see, you get a new text field. We are there, write thanks in German. And click on save. And then it says, on the second of some day, Doctor so and so wrote thank you. So we could even write um, the word for it insults in the name of another person, for doctor for example. This is of course problematic. So if you move deeper into our study, our data set is the Lithuanian Physician Review websites, uh, website. Um, so far, data from Central and Northern and Eastern Europe ha have not been researched well, except for Germany. Um, we got this idea on last year's ICIST, and we found a Lith Lithuanian researcher helping us with translating. Of course, the do goal is a little data analysis um, and using location data. I'm saying something to this later on, and a fake analysis. Thing is, Location data. Pinsetas is different from other websites because it displays the IP address of a user who has rated a physician if this person was not logged in. And oftentimes it's the case um, they display the IP address. So other uh, physician review websites do, don't do this. We want to visualize them to make some new findings. And yeah, is there maybe a problem with review fraud or fakes or? what is going on. So what's the natural language processing? As I said before, in Lithuania there are several websites we have categorized here and uh, they all deal with um, healthcare and lifestyle, health related lifestyle, but in the end there's only one physician review website and yeah, only two websites with strong participation. I think this um, second from uh, the ground level as something like a um, forum. So um, it's quite unique that users engage in a website this much. Pensetas, when it comes to our data, has a strong increase since the year of 2016. Uh, we collected the data by the end of last year and beginning of this year. 
for example, in the year of 2017, there were 13,000 uh, new reviews. There are around 57,000 healthcare providers and uh, roughly 3,000 hospitals and over 80,000 reviews in total. The first is from 2006 already. Uh, about three fourth, so 74% are positive of the reviews and 26% negative. There are 78 specialist areas. And the three most represent are general nursing, physician or odontology. And um, there are licenses in Lithuania and 85% of the profiles contain them. So they state which licenses with, uh, this physician has. Um, the healthcare providers, the physicians, are um, assigned to more oftentimes one medical institution. Uh, some are related to two or three and only a few to more than three. So we are, are practically working in three hospitals or four at the time. <laughs> but in most cases this information is just missing. So we assumed they've got their own little firm maybe. There are several rating categories, for example, diagnosis, question answering, um, how much time was used. Um, so far, only 12% of the healthcare providers have been rated, um, but there are over 160,000 recommendations. So that's um, only half of them, I said, over 80,000 reviews, and there are 80,000 more. Um, reviews without, without texts, so only giving grades. Yeah, and down here we've got a um, little review example. Um, we translated it to English. As you can see, here's the IP address given. We, due to privacy reasons, um, made this black box here. And you can see here what the um, physician can answer, like on the German portal. Um, the reviews are rather yeah, light <laughs> because uh, in Lithuania, on this website you cannot see the um, single grades for every category. On the German website you were able to see every grade given. But here you can see only the text and the grades are accumulated in an overall rating. don't see them. Yeah, the website tries to fight um, fake reviews because um, for example, some doctors, um, the profile says, okay, 23 text were reviews, and if you count them, there are only 20. So um, maybe we have, we have deleted three reviews or um, yeah, taken care of them, checking whether they are fake. Yeah, in this case, uh, for 23 reviews, the healthcare provider was rated very negatively, so maybe it was just spam, fraud. Yeah, and Pinsetas uses um, a few anti-spam measures like captures. So rather standard. Here we've got listed um, our rating dimensions. Um, in the effect, we are comparable to other um, websites, like in Germany. Some other websites across Europe only use one word, like diagnosis. Here we've got a full question. So like, were all your questions answered? Um, I think this leaves less room for speculation or for interpretation. Or how long did you wait for the appointment? And as you can see, overall the um, grades are rather very positive. And yeah, except for was there a follow-up contact? Most of the um, dimensions were rated over 11,000 times. So, um, yeah, you've got the uh, average grades for um, different um, specializations of uh, um, physicians. As you can see, some are better rated than others. Um, neurologists are not well rated, but um, odontologists, one of the most used specialization is uh, well rated. Um, this slide is quite important because we checked for fakes using natural language processing. For example, just a little finding. 
Um, the negative reviews were much longer than the positive ones, um, like twice the size. And then we used um, engrams, engram analysis. And the most common sentiment words and positive reviews are like, thanks, great, nice, uh, translated of course. Uh, and the negative reviews, they are um, very unpleasant, um, nothing good, not recommended. Um, we split all reviews in sentences. So as you can see, every review has roughly two sentences. Um, but only 96.5% of these sentences are unique. 3.5% were full copies <laughs> and we made a network analysis like over there um, connecting on the sentences to all reviews we are in and so yeah how to say that it is possible that um, some people copied just reviews um, thing is it looked like some sentences were just stick together randomly and post it in several reviews. So like a systematic fraud, but you don't know why this happened. Maybe the portal itself did this. Maybe some people wanted to um, increase their own rating, the rating of friends. It's hard to say, it's just our finding. So um, we had this case in Germany where um, the Doc Insider, the website I showed in the video, just copied full text reviews from um, the bigger website, which is called Yameda. So it was a real fraud and they got um, suited and lost. I don't know what's going on here. And we used the IP addresses to find out where other people located. As you can see, um, a hotspot is of course Lithuania, but they are in a lot of other places when they rate their doctor or their physician. Um, this somehow fits to the um, common immigration locations of people from Lithuania. So they maybe rate their doctor from their new temporary uh, home, maybe like uh, England uh, or Scandinavia. And on the other hand, it's possible that this is um, caused by fraud because people in other countries are for some reason posting reviews and uh, yeah, frauding the website. Uh, used the um, locations of the physicians to show where they are located at. Um, this again reflects um, the city size in the end effect. For example, Vilnius as the biggest city in Lithuania. Um, there seem to be the most physicians in Kaunas, second biggest, second most in Klaipeda, third biggest, third most. And some other cities are covered as well. So. As we can see, uh, this physician review website is truly comparable to physician review websites from other countries, even to the bigger ones like um, RedMDs from the USA. Um, it, but it has some extra features like showing the IP address. I think this is very good if you want to prevent some fake or spam, because um, yeah, it's obvious. Um, <laughs> but to the, uh, according to the new data protection law, this may be problematic showing the IP address. And um, there is possible review fraud. It doesn't have to be, but it might be. Um, of course, we have several findings. I mentioned before the reviews are overwhelmingly positive. The negative reviews are twice as long as the positive ones. Um, the people maybe go to a doctor at home here and rate them from their new possible temporary immigration home like London and um, yeah, <laughs> on German portal Yamea.de was the case that only 2% of the reviews were quantitative only so only grades, no text on uh, this website we have like half of them are only grades, no text and this is my presentation so thank you very much I'm here for you we didn't react to our mails for a long, long time, okay. like two years, and then the company went um, out of business and was bought by another bigger one, and then they changed the whole setting of the website. So when it was solved, but 
no one ever answered our mails. <laughs> well, yeah, from my point of view, we have different healthcare systems in Europe. Mm. Does some of the system components or strategies are reflected in the ratings? Like in Germany, we have private mm. patients and private paying patients. And um, here we weren't able to collect. Um, was another category, rating category, and it said like, did you pay extra money? Mm -hmm. And we couldn't collect it because you have had to be logged in. Um, but yeah, in the end, it was reflected because, yeah, as I read at least, <coughs> um, people often have to pay an extra cash money for getting an appointment soon. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, what is the future of your research? Um, as we are planning, we want to to um, develop some system, or it's my personal project, for different rating portals across Europe. And um, the system should recognize automatically from the text the categories that are rated and how they are rated. Um, and I want to get away from the rating schemes you have. Um, oftentimes you have stars, like five stars is the best, but sometimes you have school grades, one is the best, and so on. Mm -hmm. And my system should, yeah, find a solution to this. How, how do, you, do you deal with the different cultures in the rating? Mm -hmm. So some people are enthusiastic if they are rating mm -hmm. something, something are very, let's say, rational or more pessimistic. And there's also waves. Yeah, sometimes there is a, a, a media wave that everybody in, 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 um, in the medical domain is, is, is doing fraud. Sometimes mm -hmm. they are the, the saviors, whatever. Yeah, so there's also different, mm -hmm. so different types of bias, I would say. Uh, do you deal with this? Uh, so far not, obviously. Um, mm. But it's uh, a thing we have in mind, at least. For example, the, the American website is quite different from the German one, even though the categories are the same. But um, people write much more positive, mm -hmm. so they ex exaggerate. And Germans are like, yeah, it was okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so which is already the yeah. big plus then. <laughs> 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 yeah, big plus. <laughs> And you yeah. used NLP for yeah. this, and your group is semantic mm -hmm. orientation. Yeah. So what is, because I think the people are different mm -hmm. educated, differently. Mm -hmm. So some know a little bit about the reading internet about their disease. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, big difference between the people in cities, in rural areas, or well educated, not so well educated? Do you have information about that? Uh, obviously, we didn't find big differences because it seems like uh, people oftentimes go to physicians in big cities. Really. So it's not a really big difference between cities and rural areas because everyone goes to cities because mm -hmm. of the physicians. Yeah, so let's see what next results are. I think it's nice to have it here. It's nice to have it in comparison to the German way, <laughs> but there might be, of course, other ways which are very important. And how far can you with your NLP, analyze different languages. Mm. This is, I think, a problem if you have people here in uh, yep. Lithuania. I don't understand most, mostly no words in Lithuanian. And is this possible for your colleague, who was he was in this paper, mm. to analyze it to use special tools for NLP? And uh, I think the cover of NLP tools is oftentimes, or the coverage, is oftentimes for the bigger languages, like of course English, and maybe German, French, yeah. and Lith Lithuanian. As far as I know, we don't have that. So mm -hmm. we used his uh, knowledge, he speaks German, Lithuanian, mm -hmm. and English yeah. to translate that, and um, ah, yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, so let's see, and hope that we'll come again next year and make some report about some progress. Thanks. And, uh, Start with the part. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I like, by the way, that some of the research was initiated at another ISIS conference, so that is the intention here, so to foster cooperation. So, yeah, the next uh, uh, presentation is uh, uh, quite different. Uh, it's about uh, yeah. um, an architecture, uh, software architecture, yeah, so it's called Design of an Operator Controller Based Distributed Robotics System. Um, has nothing to do with no, something, maybe with health. We will see. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we are waiting. Go on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Go
Zügen. Ja, der Computer ist auch mal Passwort gekriegt. Session, And by the way, only 130 kilometers away from Paderborn University, so close by. And uh, yeah. Yeah. And we are based in a research institute of digital transformation. Ah, yeah. So now we have it's working. slides. So then, please, it's your floor. Okay, thank you, Carsten. So, my name is Uwe Jan, and I will talk uh, to you about the uh, design of an operator controller based distributed robotic system. So, first of all, the agenda, short introduction to my topic, concept uh, and architecture of the distributed system, and uh, then I will present to you a robot that we built and, um, and uh, with a conclusion and outlook. So, first of all, short introduction, and I would like to talk to you about the complexity of mobile robots. So, as you probably know, uh, mobile uh, robotic systems are complex technical systems whose design and advancement is a challenge for developers. So, you have um, that's both for hardware sites and software sites because um, in mobile robots, robots you have um, extensive uh, functions as well as a high number of actuators and sensors. So maybe you know the, the narrow human robot, um, it has about 90 sensors and actuators in a small mo mobile robot. And when we talk about mobile robots, we always um, have in mind that they are acting autonomously. Um, and autonomously acting robots need powerful hardware to perform complex software algorithms. So for example, running a particle filter mobile on the uh, locally on the mobile robot must be possible. Um, yeah, distributed and modular design approach. So, in the past, you've often seen um, robots that used one computer as a processing unit. So, if you think of the first examples of uh, um, of the demonstrators of the robot operating system, ROS, we had this uh, robot that always had a computer on it, like like a laptop. But uh, with uh, embedded systems like single board computers, so single board computers are like Raspberry Pi or Arduino boards, um, these embedded systems are more energy efficient and more suitable for uh, processing units on a mobile robots due to its size and, yeah, and the energy efficiency. So, but um, when we think about the complexity of robots, maybe it's not enough to have one single single board computer. We have to use uh, multiple ones to obtain more computing power. So we, what we are, we are doing is we combine multiple single board computer computer to a distributed system within one robot. So we are not talking about a distributed system with uh, two robots or three or whatever. We're talking about a distributed system within one robot. Um, yeah, and when when we distribute our system itself, we have to uh, create interfaces between the the single board computers and the models. So we are working in a modular way, and uh, the modular approach itself um, is very good to extend your robot um, for specific tasks or something like this. So one example is a mirror robot from our partner university in Bielefeld, um, which is a small uh, mobile, ro mobile robot uh, with a modular approach. Okay, so what, oh, this is, um, yeah, and one obvious reason to use more than one processing unit on a robot is that you are not depending on one processing unit. Um, you, um, yeah, you can solve problems that maybe are not able to solve with one processing unit. Um, what, what I'm uh, doing or we are doing in our um, research 
we um, concentrate on, on the architecture that we are using within our distributed system. So um, in the past, there always were distributed systems within a robot or a technical system, but often the architecture has grown historically. So for example, you had a Raspberry Pi on it, then an Arduino uh, was added to the system or something like this, but um, this often um, had the problem that um, you mix real-time tasks with um, comfort fe features, for example, and this is normally not a good thing, even for, um, or, or at least for robotics or autonomous uh, vehicles. Um, so we are um, concentrating on how to design distributed system architecture and um, how to integrate real-time autonomy, comfort fe features in such architecture. So um, let's talk about the concept and concepts and architecture of the distributed system that we built. So um, first of all, I want to show you this um, picture from a book called uh, General Technology, something like this from, 90, from the 1980s from Mr. Ropol. Um, in his book, he, um, he showed this activity system which is layered in different layers. So we have the, uh, the button layer where we have the ex execution system and information system above. And what is clearly um, <coughs> outlined is that we have material um, only working with the executing sh execution system and yeah, information then in the layers above. So we have a structured design. Later then in about 2000, there uh, was invented this operator controller module from um, actually from the University of Paderborn um, which um, uses the same concept so at least it, it is structured um, in, um, um, in, two, in two parts so we have the controller part which is our execution system this one uh, the controllers are um, connected to our sensors and to our actuators so uh, to our physical system. So the co controllers itself control our physical system and the operator, the brain above, um, controls then the controller but not the, the physical system itself. So what we can do here is we can divide in uh, hard real-time that we need with the controller and uh, softer real-time in the operator part. So we are using this concept that was uh, invented for a mechatronic system like a rail cap um, in robotics now um, so same uh, same picture but um, that should show that we have uh, on the controllers itself we have not this high computing power but when you think about the operator which then um, is used to, to run tasks or something like uh, what the robot actually is doing then we need higher complexity and we can divide our um, system in uh, an action level, which is a controller part, which needs hard real-time, and a planning level with soft real-time that I already mentioned. Um, so the, the concept um, summarized, we have a hierarchically layered architecture um, with, <laughs> with time discrete versus event-driven um, um, yeah, patterns. So uh, time discrete, um, obviously, with the controllers, and event driven um, with uh, the operator. So the controllers, for example, um, needs to stop immediately in case of emergency. So we have hard real time and time discrete functions functionality, and the operators are responding to events from the controllers. So um, they are event driven. That's why we use model based development um, in our system for the operator um, because yeah, this event-driven engineering uh, approach is of course very suitable for model-based model, model -based principles like state charts or something like this. Um, okay, so then next uh, the design of our um, robot, robot which is a demonstrator for the architecture I just showed you um, is called DAEBot it's a uh, distributed architecture evaluation robot and yeah is the DAE board is developed to evalu evaluate distributed architecture within one robot so we're testing this OCM approach and other ones um, 
um, to evalu evaluate it. So we are using a modular design and especially we are using only single board computers that are uh, widely available so that uh, promises to make the design of uh, different uh, modules of the robot very easy. So for example we are using typical Arduino uh, boards or Raspberry Pis that we can give to our students. Uh, they can work with it very easy and then we bring everything to together to um, build the bigger robot. Um, yeah, that's the actual design of the robot, so the modules. So, whoops, in the, in the middle we have the controller parts. Um, we have a so-called health controller, which I will talk to you about later. But first, the internal robot controller is some kind of every robot has this um, controller, like uh, reading the motor encoders, driving the motors itself, um, this one has the ultrasonic sensors detached, um, attached and uh, internal um, sensors from the board. So this is an SDM 32F3 discovery. Um, then we had a cam controller to um, get vision, so computer vision parts in it, like we have an RGB camera on it and the death cam. And what we also have is, um, so that's in Raspberry Pi, we have an Arduino Mega on it, um, which is the so-called health controller. The health controller is not in terms of health like we heard in the first presentation, but in terms of uh, health of our technical system, like mm -hmm. um, how are the temperatures, there are temperature sensors, how is the power consumption, how is the CPU usage, something like this. So this is done by the health controller, um, has some um, bigger extensions like a relay board, so the health controller, for example, is able to uh, start and shut down every um, component of our system. And above it, we have our operator, which currently is a Raspberry Pi. Um, yeah, the, the operator itself then um, gets all the information from the controllers and um, um, acts to this. And what we can do with the relay board, for example, is that um, we have here an RGB cam and a death cam on the cam controller and we can decide or the operator can decide which of, of uh, both we are using so if we have um, we have a lot of lights and maybe we don't use uh, don't need to use the death camera so we can shut it down with the health controller to, um, to for higher energy efficiency or we can um, turn it on again um, yeah, then we have another operator which is an FPGA board. So that's that's the idea of this modular approach that we can add uh, specific hardware for specific tasks. So for this example, we are uh, using an FPGA board to run our OpenCV um, algorithms as they are working much efficient, much more efficient on a FPGA board than on a Raspberry Pi. Um, yeah, all this is connected via CAN. So our communications is done with controller area network. Um, or what I did forget to mention is that the idea of this demonstrator is to use uh, many different evaluation boards. So we have a Raspberry Pi, which is another type than the STM32, for example. So we wanted to combine um, one of every uh, of um, yeah, f of many um, areas. So uh, the communications, uh, we are via CAN. We developed the self, um, we self developed a publisher subscribers concept. You probably know from robotic operating system, for example, from ROS. So what we can do, we can, um, we can alter the sample rate of our subscribers, for example. So we some kind of um, use the concept from a robot operating system and use it for ourselves and extend it a little bit. Uh, we use our own CAN frame IDs. Mm -hmm. So normally you have a 11-bit CAN ID and we split it into identity, which is normal, priority and another so-called uh, command or sensor bit. So that we can alter the priority directly in our identity, which makes sense for using hard real time for example and to uh, decouple um, motor driver codes from OpenCV codes for example. 
Um, programming languages and methods, we are using, so when you think about the controllers, uh, they need to run hard real time, so they should be as efficient as possible. Um, so we used about 95% of C and a little bit of C++. Um, but these controllers are all uh, only uh, developed once. So if the controller is, uh, was, is implemented, um, then it will never change. It will reconfigure, but it will not change. And um, the operator itself will change from task to task, what, whatever the robot should do. Um, so we are using MATLAB Simulink's state flow there, which is a model-based tool for yeah, state charts. And you should probably know it. Um, what else we can do with this MATLAB Simulink state flow approach is we can simulate our um, behavior of our uh, robotic system in advance. So we can um, yeah, give some dump um, com CAN messages in there and check our system before we load it actually to the robot. Um, yeah, and what's what I mentioned at the very beginning is that um, using a distributed system within our robot um, is helpful for safety reasons because we don't use one single uh, processing unit where everything uh, depends on. So what we are doing, every, um, every module of our robot has some safety features like simple ones, a local watchdog uh, that just checks if the connection is still working to the operator. And for example, when the internal robot controller which runs the motors um, detects that the connection to the operator breaks down, then it just freezes the uh, um, the motor so that nothing could ever happen. And it's also possible then to restart the operator in case it's, it breaks down with the health controller. So this is uh, how the robot actually looks like. So the, the idea of it is that we have this layered structure from the operator controller module in the operator, uh, in the demonstrator itself. So we have the internal robot controller here, the health controller here, which is pretty big. Uh, because of the relays and on top which you can see here we have uh, the operator part which then um, is added uh, with um, Raspberry Pi display for visualization features. So the, the demonstrator itself is a demonstrator for the architecture. Okay so conclusion and outlook. We successfully implemented the operator controller module on our self-developed DAE bot and uh, the decentralized approach is useful, for example, to design scalable robot platforms which can easily be extended, like I showed with the FPGA approach. Um, the operator controller module architecture is helpful in robotics, for example, to decouple time critical functions from non time critical functions like visualization. And um, yeah, the project is still running and uh, we are currently working on uh, another layer above the operator um, which is called cognitive operator for self-optimization features um, so that yeah the robot can optimize itself uh, yep yeah, i'm done thanks Yes, about controller and a bus. Uh, have you looked at the other designs like that? Uh, when you develop it to your controller and a bus? Yeah, we, we use the typical uh, approach that, that is used. Uh, yeah, but I mean, uh, you mentioned that the, the, the your format of the uh, yeah, normally application you is some kind of unique. Yeah, yeah we, we uh, al alter this. Uh, typically, you have just an identifier f in the start of your CAN frame, which just um, yeah is just the identity. But we alter it and add some priority in it. That's typically uh, so you have a priority like uh, a lower um, number of this identity is always hi has always a higher priority than uh, a low a higher number, the other way around. <laughs> but we um, added this um, priority bits in there to have um, a more pr precise um, yeah, priority to use it. For example, 
the controllers itself can change the priority to make uh, clear that something's happening that is unusual. So it changes the, the priority and it, this is detected and there's already going something on with it. And for priority you have only two bits which allows only four different categories, right? Yes, but it's enough. It's, so it's enough, right? Yeah, for now it's enough. You have just, like, uh, for motor drivers you have a high uh, priority and for, I don't know, visualization tools you have the lowest one. That's, that's what we do there. So more questions. I have maybe an additional question mm -hmm. adding to, to your question. So uh, meaning if you are using the identifier, the can identifier as a priority that it is fixed for the whole time lifetime of the system because it can identify yes. it's, it's fixed and now you have a dynamic yes. aspect so you can change yeah. while in operation you can change priorities. Yeah, as f for example, you the ultrasonic sensors run with a medium priority mm -hmm. and then when you hit an obstacle um, the priority rises and that's another um, hint for the operator there's something going on then that this one needs to be focused and needs to be uh, processed earlier. Something like this. And, and maybe you can say something if you have several robots uh, and you want to couple them, swarm, swarm activity, something like this. On what on what layer of your uh, layered system will you do which coupling? So which effects will make which layers talk to each other? So typically in this approach, you will make the operators of different robots and talk to each other, um, just that you don't uh, get in trouble with the hard real time for the um, for the controller parts. Mm -hmm. Is there any situation where you would couple also the controller layers and have a real-time communication? Not sure. We didn't. So we are not working on this currently. Not sure if we mm -hmm. will have some example for this. For example, if they are cooperating, handling together something, it need to be synchronously operated. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Other questions. Okay, then uh, thank you for the presentation. Yeah. And uh, we will hand over to the next part of the session. I'm very sincere thank to our session chairs. Yeah. And I, I have to distribute the certificates for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Ah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Rao. Thank you very much. True friend of this conference. We are starting second half with another two presentations. The first speaker is Gregory Pusevich. Yes. Yeah. So we hope to see more details soon about the mandatory electrical subject to cyclic production of flow constraints. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Well, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my paper I would like to show you a presentation about the uh, cyclic scheduling and routing of unmanned aerial vehicles in short drones. Uh, the presentation has following form and let's start from the first point, the cyclic system. Here is an example of cyclic transportation system where we have 
uh, eight vehicles here, which are moving along the given cyclic roads. These vehicles are used to transport materials and work pieces between the workstations along, in this case, two production roads, red and blue. Uh, please note that the operation of these vehicles are cyclically and production operations are cyclically too. Therefore, this system can be easily represented by the following concurrent cyclic processes system, in short, CCP system, where the workstations are represented by the resources, vehicles are represented by the following local cyclic processes with these big tokens here. This blue process represents these blue vehicles. And uh, the manufacturing streams, red and blue, are represented by the following multimodal processes, red and blue. In this system, we assume that the local processes representing vehicles are executed concurrently and cyclically. Moreover, we use the mutual exclusion protocol. That means, in one time, one resource can be occupied by only one local processes, one big token. In turn, multimodal processes representing uh, manufacturing flows uh, can be treated as a composition of parts of local processes. For example, this red process can be seen as a composition of part of process blue here, part of process yellow here, and part of process brown here. In other words, this red process with small red token is like a passenger which uses many transportation means, many big tokens to move in this system. Okay, this representation is used to describe behaviors of many real systems and in our case this is the multi-product batch production system where the transport operations between the workstations are executed using by the aerial vehicles, by the drones. In that context uh, the local processes represent the transport operation of the drones between this workstation, these yellow arrows, and multimodal processes represent the production of operations of given production roads, for example, red and blue, uh, blue and red in this case. Okay, so what we want to know? If we know the structure of this kind of system. We know the CCP representation, we know the parameters of the fleets, number of drones, capacity of batteries, and etc., speeds. We want to know what roads of these drones guarantee that in this system will be available the production with this and this stream with given tag time on the output. And to answer this question, we formulate in our paper declarative model and the first element of this model is the structure. The CCP structure, for example for this small structure, is described by the following parameters and among them I should distinguish set of resources. Here, in CCP system we have two kinds of resources, local and shared. Shared resources are here and are the places where processes have to fight to the axis and you know, in order to avoid the collisions between these processes we use the set of dispatching rules. When one dispatching rule is the sequence which determines the order in which processes can get access to the one shared resource. For example, this sequence, these dispatching rules means that first access to this resource is for process 2, next for process 3, next for process 2 and once again this order is repeated. Okay, this kind of dispatching rules and these parameters determines the possible admissible behavior of given CCP system and the behavior is the second element of proposed model and here is an example of a behavior for given structure this is an example of cyclic behavior, this is the cyclic schedule why cyclic? because each column, each state, each allocation of processes is, re is repeated with constant period, in this case 24 but how to generate, calculate this kind of cyclic behaviors for a given structure, behaviors without collisions, deadlocks, and etc. And during the, our research, we tried to find the conditions which uh, guarantee this kind of cyclic behavior in the in, in given structure. And here is example, short example for 
of our results, this is the part, this is part of the set of constraints which should be satisfied to calculate the schedule. In general, this constraint have the following form and this is the relation of moments of operation beginning of local and multi modal processes operation. And this relation should be satisfied for each operation in this schedule, each pair of operation in this schedule. Okay, we describe these constraints detailed in our paper, but how to use these constraints to answer the other question. In our paper we show that considered problem here and with our question can be formulated as a constraint satisfaction problem, which is a triple X, D, C. Where X, this is the set of decision variables, and in our case decision variables contain the sequence of dispatching rules, uh, moments of operation uh, beginning, tag time, and uh, roads of uh, aerial vehicles. And C is the set of constraints which describe our system. Constraints which contains the structure of our, constraints describing the structure of our system, and constraints which guaranteeing that this, this system will be available to cyclic behaviors. In that context, to answer this question, we have to solve this problem. Solve this problem, that means we have to find the value of variable sex, which for each all constraints will be satisfied. To solve this problem, we use typical constraint programming environment. In our case, we use OS Mozart system. This is open source environment for constraint programming. And uh, now I want to show you how to use this approach on the example, small example. Given is the following system with uh, five workstations, one input and output uh, buffer. We have two production roads, blue here and red here. Uh, we have fleet of three drones we, where we know the capacity of level of battery and we know structure of transportation network. Here, these are our flight corridors. We know the times of uh, travels, we know the consumption energy on each travel, and we want to know what roads of these vehicles, these drones, guarantee that in this system will be available the production with given tag time less than 60 in this case. To answer this question, we formulate our problem as a constraint satisfaction problem. We implemented it in the Osmotar system and we tried to solve it, and after 76 seconds in this case, we obtain the first admissible solution. And this is our result. This is the road, a very complex road for free aerial vehicles. This is one cyclic road for free common, for common roads for free vehicles. Uh, this vehicle is moving along this road, but in, this, in different places. And this road guaranteed that in this system will be available the production with given tag time 53 unit times. Here, you can see how works our system in this solution. This uh, big tokens, green, uh, yellow, and violet, uh, represent our drones. The small tokens represent transported elements red and blue and this is the our schedule and as you may see the tag time is equal to 53 units times that means uh, in 53 units times this system leave one product of blue and one product of red maybe you can see for the moment oh this red element is transported to output in our experiments, we tried to find the number of uh, drones which guarantee the lowest level of tag time. And this table shows that the four fleet with the four drones, we have the, the best uh, solution. And here we can see the our optimal solution where we use four uh, aerial vehicles and we have the tag times equal to 53 units time. But this solution is possible only if we uh, use the corridors, flight corridors on different levels and these green corridors are placed higher than others. We have to use that because uh, on some, uh, to avoid the collisions between the uh, drones on the crossing corridors.
these two corridors should be placed higher than others. Okay, this is our optimal solution, but how looks the consumption energy? Uh, in our consumption, in our optimal solution, if we assume the following uh, level of uh, capacity batteries, uh, these drones should change battery once per one cycle, one per 38 units time, and uh, these drones should change battery on the ones from three uh, workstations, R1 here, R3 here, and R5 here. Uh, is it possible the easier solution where the drones change the battery on the one workstation here and here and here and here but it is possible when we use the uh, higher level of capacity battery 100 or 200 or 200 okay this is our short short experiments and uh, now I want to show you short conclusion remarks as you may see, the site exclusion problems can be easily implemented in constraint programming environment. Our approach is quite effective because uh, because we are allowed to obtain the solution in about one minute for the problems with five drones and about 15, uh, 15 workstations. And uh, but in our solution, we have uh, uh, sometimes we have to use the corridors with different levels. Therefore, in the future, we want to extend uh, our model by constraints, which allowed, uh, which allowed to, have which allowed to avoid the constraints between the crossing, crossing corridors. That is our future. And now, this is, this is, all from me. Thank you very much. Yes. So distributing the task set, making sure that that, uh, um, that you can run things in the appropriate time. Uh, did, did you use any of the uh, let's say partitioning, mapping uh, um, systems that they use for automotive things? Because there's a high number of tasks, mm -hmm. more than one thousand, two thousand tasks that are distributed uh, and uh, uh, scheduled, mm -hmm. and uh, they use constraint programming uh, for this. Also with similar runtimes. Um, so, is there any uh, a connection between these two worlds that you are using this for vehicles uh, um, for, for scheduling? Uh, oh, for we use only constraint programming environment. In the future, we want to try to different ways to solve these problems because mm -hmm. computational complexity is uh, right, very yeah. high in this yeah. case and. Uh, yes, we plan to in the future try the other other solutions. Mm -hmm. But now we start from this because it is very flexible and comfortable for the model. Yeah. Uh, and if we know that it works in this case, in the future we want to extend, try to use the other models with, mm -hmm. with different different uh, with uh, not. Okay, we, we try to find the other, we try to use uh, and other models and other environments to solve this kind mm -hmm. of problems. Mm -hmm. More questions? No, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, there is a certificate oh, thank for you the presentation of your talk. Oh, thank you very much. Next speaker is... <coughs> Okay. <laughs>
Peter Schendrick from Sumi State University present the topic and integral of fuzzy the power quality assessment for decision support system and management of power network is distributed generation. Hello everyone. Uh, this uh, work is uh, completed with my colleagues from Kharkov National Technical University of, of Agriculture and doing uh, in both in the two universities in Ukraine. The next university is the Sumer State University, the mine, my, uh, my university. Let's consider the typical small distributed power system consists of the array of, uh, of solar panels of the building and equipment with, uh, with wind turbines and energy storage bank and also there is connection with the external power power grid described uh, the significant advan advantages for such hybrid system it is very difficult to assess the was capacity of renewable energy sources used in economy as it uh, clearly illustrated for this uh, figure the, there are two flow, flow, flowers, electrical and informatics, information, according to main idea, uh, according uh, main, uh, to main idea about systems uh, st stable, reliable, reliable, <laughs> firstly, it's Im important to build adequate distribution uh, be between sources based on electrical flow. Information flow support is provided by the management of a power system using smart grid technologies. In smart grid, it is necessary to control both information and electrical flows, flow, flows and here important to note, note that control of information flow, flow helps to control electrical flow. To control them, it is necessary to use different energy management stages. The power network with distributed generation is characterized by a rapid change of operation models depending on external condition. The process of making decision is in case of distributed network management is characterized by big amount of discrete variables that have impact in overall system. Opera operatively of decision-making process plays an important role in the management process. It can be achieved by means of de decision support systems. So it is necessary to implement information technologies in the management process of distributed power network operation models. This solution will allow consumers to make a decision with the provide generation efficiency and consumption of electricity. Generally, the input data are the forecast values of the load defined the needs in renewable energy resources for central period in future and the market price for electricity. The main function of such system are to manage the power and the energy between sources and load in, into the sm smart power network with distributed generation to make a schedule of energy generation and to evaluate the cost of energy production and emission. The planning simulation operation and control of electrical energy system involved information and phenomena that in a naturally associated with temporal and scenario dimensions. Each one of these dimensions has specific scales and granularity requirements associated with the relate system behavior. The planning, safe and optimal operation management of smart grid is a multi-dimensional and multi-scale problem. Multi-scale 
dimension making is a growing area in multi-scale optimization, the aim of which is to develop a gener generally generalized strategical formation, formalism that described a large variety of complex systems in an effective way. As a result, the entire system I is optimized while considered the interaction between the scale by means of uh, coordinated information. We observe the smart grid uh, customers are faced with a multi-scale dimension making problem energy management uh, based on set of criteria. The characteristic characters that occur during this process is, is listed on this figure. The process of uh, creating power network with distributed generation I is considered as a set of tasks at each involved stage, planning, design, installation and operation. This study focused on the operation stages. We are proposed the unified integrated approaches to addressing the, the problem of improving the quality of decision making process with management of operation power network with distributed generation and we co focus on the successful functioning of the distributed generation infrastructure the electrical power quality can be considered as uh, the main performance criteria of the distributed network. But in fact, the term electrical power quality is fuzzy. The purpose of the study is to the determine the performance criterion of the distributed ner network, which is, which is power uh, quality index uh, in the fuzzy form for use it under condition of uncertainty information in decision support system in order in order of achieve this purpose in view it is necessary to solve the following tasks the presentation power quality in the fuzzy form and the formation integral fuzzy concept of fuzzy quality, of, of power quality. quality. Uh, the assessment of power quality index Sorry. the assessment of power quality index uh, power quality index are uh, this uh, Decloser of information undersently during uh, the analysis of the power quality index are considered uh, today as uh, uncorrelated task. The deterministic approach is widely used for calculation. As uh, to the measurements according to the international requirements of methodology and standardization, Oh, sorry, I need some to something. As to the measurements according to the international requirements of methodology and standardization, it is recommended to consider the main quality assessment of measurements as uh, uncertainty. Some 
Instruments for measurements of the public quality index can present the result in the form of a histogram. After normalization, such histogram can be regarded as a fuzzy representation of the power quality index in the form of fuzzy set with a step membership function enveloping the histogram. The power quality index as voltage fluctuation uh, non sinusoidal voltage, voltage unbalanced uh, uh, frequency dev deviation, etc. are measurement within 24 hours. The instrument, instrument forms a histogram using the given set of measurements. The range uh, from uh, PQ uh, power quality index minimum to power quality index maximum is divided into n of equal interval di and the histogram for frequency of getting of the power quality index uh, measurements into special intervals is built. After normalization we obtain the histogram the We form fuzzy set of the power quality index based on the obtained histogram. This set is uh, within the range uh, from power quality index minimum to power quality index maximum. The membership function is a step functions function, step function mu. And development the histogram. As we can see, this representation of the quality index does not uh, require considering the fuzzy set into any pr pr particular case of well studied type of fuzzy set. Con uh, secondly, there is no need to make a significant upgrade of the measurement instrument software. However, the peculiarity in the measurement of uh, quality index with the particular power networks is still presented. Power quality limits are uh, different in, in the form of interval of normally admissible and uh, maximum permission value, values. That, that is uh, the limit definition itself contains an element of enter uh, uncertainty. <coughs> it is because there is a necessity to define if the power quality index meets the quality limits with the interval between the normal admission uh, ad admissible and the maximum permissible values. For the decision making system it is important not only to make the recommend when the quality index exists the limit, but also it is necessary to, to prevent the risk of such situation. These limits can be represented by a fuzzy set that is fuzzy interval with trapezoidal, uh, trapezoidal membership function. The values of the power quality limits minimum and power quality limits maximum is in this equation are specified in the norm normative documents. The conformally degree of fuzzy values of the power quality index to fuzzy power quality limits limit can be evaluated by the membership function of the intersection. In this case, the conformity degree is preferred to express uh, as number rather than that function. So we propose the following approach. The interaction of fuzzy set can be numerically estimated by the area of interaction of two sh shapes, S shapes. The first one is shape uh, 
Uh, pouze... Sorry. The first one is a shape bounded by the abscissa axis, axis at the membership function of the power quality index. The second one is the shape bounded by the abscissa axis at the membership function of power quality limit. The membership function of conforming of the fuzzy power quality index to the fuzzy limits of power quality can be representation as uh, this. Let's consider two cases uh, which show the difference between fuzzy and uh, deterministic approaches. In the first case, the measurements of the voltage in the phase A is the following uh, 25 percent of the values exists uh, existed the upper limits according of the limits uh, the power quality index for voltage deviation in fa phase a does not conform the limits fuzzy assessment of the con conform uh, conformity of these parameters to the limits was uh, 0.699. This assessment uh, uh, versus the deterministic one presents the degree of conformity of the par these parameters for, for to the limits. In the second case, the voltage measurements in the phase, uh, phase A show that this, this is no violation of the limits. So the power quality indexes for voltage deviation in the phase A conform the limits. The fuzzy assessment of the parameters was uh, 0 0.801. It means that the value of this parameter approaches in the limit limits. This the data can be used in the decision support system for preventive actions regarding normalization of a voltage de deviation in the phase A. Also, the fuzzy assessment provides the possibility to monitor the quality assessment and the efficiency of the accepted dis decisions aims to improve the electrical power quality even if quality indexing conforms this limit. The considered case shows that the fuzzy assessment of the quality indexes is more informative in terms of intelligent decision support system. There are the number of indexes characterization of various aspects of the power quality. Most of them can be presented in the fuzzy form according to the proposed method. The fuzzy representation on of the conformity of the quality indexes for the accepted limits allows us to form integral fuzzy concept of the power quality. This is because the fuzzy set optimization operation sorry, are definitely projected on membership function operations. In this case, the physical nature of the quality indexes is of no con consequence. The, the simple, simplest approach to the formation of the integral concept of the quality based on the logic logical operation of fuzzy set interaction was given uh, in in uh, many many works research the fuzzy concept of quality uh, is formed 
as this form. In the case uh, different types of load are critical for different power quality indexes. Therefore, it is possible to form integrated uh, genera uh, generalized quality indexes for power networks with predominance of some type of load using the described approach. For, for electrical load, for lightning load, for devices with microprocessor control. And the main conclusions of this talk we can see of this slide. Uh, we presented for you the falsification method of uh, assessment of uh, quality indexes and quality limits of power, power electrical. I'm ready to to your questions, to ask your questions. My contact on this slide, please. you obtain these uh, values for the voltages from the sensors? They are shown on uh, what uh, hourly basis? Uh, in the very first slides somewhere it was a diagram of the spread of different voltages. What slide? Uh, that one. That one? Yes. With what precision they obtain it? How frequently? So this is the time line, right? Yes. And this it's obviously voltage, oh, this is. Yes. Um, uh, obviously, because during the night time, it is increasing, voltage. right? Yeah. During day, it is decreasing. During night, exactly increasing. And so, uh, how frequently you are me measuring it? Okay. In time? Yes, yes, yes. What time intervals? I don't know. <laughs> this is not my because book. Here is shown uh, precision with some minutes, right? Yeah, yeah, I think. But is it like uh, every every minute? Every minute? Okay, like every minute. I think it's. No questions? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Also, thank you to our chairs, Professor Alvisa. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Yura, thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs> so, what is now? Lunch break? Yeah, we, we will have lunch now.